Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Mike Francesa Podcast. The Mike Francesa Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network is brought to you by Casamigos Tequila. Casamigos Tequila is brought to you by those who drink it. We couldn't have a busier Monday. All kinds of crazy stuff. Coaches moving, and we'll get to the Calipari news in a couple of minutes. Uh, Eclipse this afternoon, which I don't want to downgrade, but uh, I'm just not. I'm just not into it. Okay. We'll get to that later. The Masters is right around the corner. This is Masters Week, and we will cover it like a blanket, wall to wall. And I don't care if you're even not a golf fan. If you're not a golf fan, become one. Watch the Masters. There are a few events like the Masters, which will begin on Thursday. But first, we have a national title game tonight as the two big guys finally are here. Uh, I picked this game as the final before the championship started. I don't think that was any great achievement. Um, I would have been happier if I got all four final four teams right. I didn't. I lost. I missed Houston. Uh, I picked Houston, Purdue, uh, UConn, and Alabama. Uh, I told you I thought both favorites would win. I actually thought both would win easier than they did. Both covered. But I thought Purdue would win easier. I thought they would pull away in the second half. They had a lot more trouble because their guards played absolutely awful basketball. And Smith's game was one of the worst final four games for a lead guard I've ever seen. Um, And UConn really had a tough time. Let's be honest. Give Alabama credit. Here's the thing, though. Alabama played as good of offensive first half as you can possibly play as a team at the Final Four. First of all, Final Four is usually a very tough place to get settled. Early game on Saturday, usually teams very much struggle with their depth perception because it's such a big building. It's a very odd setup with the basketball floor. I hate the way they do it. And it really makes it very tough. You just don't feel comfortable shooting in that setting. But Alabama put on a show. I mean, they shot the lights out in the first half. They shot 8 of 11 from 3. Now, you're 8 of 11 from 3. You're a Final Four team. There is no way you can be losing at halftime. They were. Which told you all you need to know about Connecticut. And Connecticut only, and I picked Connecticut, Okay, I've been on them. I picked, I, I, I played them before the tournament started. I told you all along I thought they'd win this thing. I told you they were ahead above everybody else. They still are. Connecticut only covered that point spread because of the fact that they hit those big threes in the last two minutes. I mean, Kevin hit a three, then Newton hit a three, and then Spencer hit a three. If they don't hit those threes, they don't cover but they did and they covered. So they wound up, they kept their record intact. They have won 11 straight over the last two years NCAA tournament games, and they've covered all 11, which is absurd. It really is. It's absurd. But they have done that. And they are a very heavy favorite when you consider Purdue. Purdue has the player of the year. They have a guy who has been... In terms of offensive efficiency, one of the best players to play in college basketball in many years, in ED this year. Purdue is an elite offensive team. As an offensive team, their metrics are way ahead of of Connecticut's. But Connecticut has a terrific big man in Klingon who's gotten better all the time. He is a better athlete than Edie. He is a better defensive player than Edie. He's not anywhere near the offensive player. And Edie and what he can do in terms of scoring, getting people in foul trouble, and then passing the ball to perimeter shooters, that's a big key. Purdue did not hit their threes against Tennessee. But Edie went to the foul line 22 times and scored 40 points against Tennessee. He played terribly against NC State. He put the ball down low. He got it stripped. He made bad passes. He let NC State push him out. 
I thought he played badly, but not anywhere near as badly as the backcourt. Jones was huge for Purdue. Absolutely huge. And they just wore down. They actually hurt NC State with their defense because of the size of Edie, because their game was inside. And Horn did a great job for NC State, kept them in the game the whole way. Really, was dynamic. But they didn't have another scorer. And Burns couldn't score inside, really, with any strength against Edie, which I told you that going in. So Purdue didn't play well. They played badly offensively. As Smith said, I stunk the joint out. He did. He was one for seven from the floor. He hit one three, and he had six turnovers. He had two backcourt violations. I mean, he was awful. And they still won going away in a low-scoring, ugly game. The UConn game against Alabama was a good game. And when Alabama tied it at 56, you said, okay. Now, Alabama made a decision. They were going to play off Castle. Castle is an incredible talent. He's not a good outside shooter yet. He shot in the high 20s this year from three. He opened the game, banged a three. He banged another three. And then... UConn put him in the game in the offense as a screener and let him play off that, get weak side rolled to the basket for dunks, get behind the defense. Remember, it was Castle at 56 who got fouled, went to the line, made his free throws, then got a bucket in the lane, a little teardrop, and now they're up 60-56 and never headed. It was Castle who did that. It was Castle and the team in scoring. He had two points against Illinois. He led the team against, against Alabama. He scored 21 points. That's the versatility of what UConn brings. Now, we've talked about UConn for months. They have no weakness. They can play at any speed. And they prefer to play a little slower. As a matter of fact, this game tonight probably will not be as fast-paced as you think. Do not be surprised if this game's in the high 60s. Because neither team plays that fast. The one thing they both do is get offensive rebounds and they'll score off those. Other than that, this could be a really low-scoring game. The question you want to ask is this. A, is the the line too high at six and a half? If you go historically with what Purdue has done this year, the line is too high. But if you go by the fact that UConn never plays a close game. I mean, they won by 14 on Saturday, and they were outplayed a good part of that game. They have this ability to do this every single day. They just are relentless. They're like, it's like stopping water. You stop it here, it comes out over here. over here. They can never, ever, an opponent can never get complete containment of them at any point. And if you go into a scoring drought, which Purdue does not do very often because of the big man, you have big problems. You have to keep those scoring droughts. And O's did a good job of that. There were not that many big runs. There was the one run late that allowed them to get the big lead and get the lead they did there, win the game. How does Purdue win the game tonight? Remember this, everything Purdue does is offensive. Purdue is an elite offensive team. They're a good offensive rebounding team. They get to the foul line. They have three players who shoot very above 45% or right around 45 or above from three. They can hit that short corner off an 80 pass. Gillis hit a couple of those that were big. Jones hit some big threes, and they survived the Smith nightmare against NC State. How can they win the game? They're going to win the game on offense. They have to overcome their defense. Purdue is a poor to just flat-out bad perimeter defensive team. They don't handle screens well. And they do not stop people from getting open looks. 
NC State got open looks all night. They just didn't hit a lot of them other than Horn. And Horn kept them in the game. They give up good looks all the time. Now, UConn is an erratic three-point shooting team. Even as good as Spencer is, he can be erratic. But all four of those guys, all four of those guys can knock down a three. You know that. They've done it. They've done it in the past. They can all knock down a three. So going in and knowing that, the key guy, Spencer's going to do what he does. And to me, the guy who makes them go is Spencer. He makes them go. Sorry for Taylor barking, but someone might be at the door. But that's okay. Don't worry about it. Um, Spencer makes them go. He makes all the big decisions. He has the ball in his hands late. He gets in the lane. He flips the ball inside to the bigs. He makes good passes. He has a great head fake in the lane to hit the two. He goes out and hits the three. He is the dagger guy for that team. He seems to always be there to hit that big shot. But the guy you have to watch is Caravan. And Caravan is going to be an interesting player in this in this game because you know that Klingon is going to play straight up on Edie. The one difference is this. Klingon does not play anywhere near the minutes that Edie plays. Klingon does not go above 30 minutes. Now, tonight I'm sure he'll try to go above 30 minutes, but I don't see him going much above 30 minutes, which means Johnson's going to be in the game. He's going to try and run him. He's going to try and get ahead of him and get those lobs. He's great at that. Johnson's pretty good. He's a pretty decent backup player. But Klingon's going to be in that game, and how Purdue plays when Klingon's out of the game is going to be a fascinating 10 to 12 minutes or more if he gets in foul trouble. So I don't see them needing to play anybody. They're going to play Klingon straight up on Edie, but when Edie comes and makes that turn into the lane, they are going to come back the guards are going to come back to strip the ball because Edie has a habit of taking the ball and making it low. And when he brings it down low, he loses the ball. They're going to go in there and try and strip the ball away. You're going to see that time and again. They're all going to do that. Castle's going to go in and dig and do that. They're all going to dig and try and take the ball away. Now they might commit some fouls away because UConn commits fouls. But Klingon has not fouled out of a game this year, and he's only had four fouls eight times. So will he get in foul trouble tonight? I believe he will. Will he get in dire foul trouble, which means he gets two in the first three minutes of the game? I, who knows? I'm sure Purdue is going to go right in and try and establish it right away with Edie. It's going to be a fascinating game to have these two bigs. These are two, first of all, very good teams playing in the championship game. There's no mismatch here. UConn's favorite because their numbers are staggering in what they've done recently and how overwhelming they've been against every opponent. But they have, a, you know, the player of the year. They're a very efficient offensive team. Their metrics are superb. I'm not a metrics guy, but their numbers are superb. They get to the foul line. They make their foul shots. They make their threes. Usually, they have three guys who can knock it down. And you're going to figure Smith, who is usually very good when the defense hedges, will he hit those shots today? They'll be there for him. Will he hit them? I figure he can't play worse. I mean, he, he just played an absolute nightmare. His first shot will be very interesting tonight. If it goes in, you got a different game. If he misses, who knows, it might play into his head because he really had a nightmare on Saturday. The versatility of the other four players for Connecticut is what makes Connecticut go. They have four guys, and they all can do virtually everything. Newton, he's like a Swiss Army knife. You can use him in any way. Castle can guard anybody and is going to be a, a terrific pro. He's a lottery pick. Great athletic skills, great ability to jump. I mean, just terrific talent. And Caravan is a, such an underrated player because he hits you with the dagger three. He can go inside. He can go outside. Now, the one thing here is that Purdue is a really good offensive 
rebounding team, and they got a size advantage here. So it's going to be interesting to see how much they muscle Caban with their power forward. Whether they go down to him and throw him the ball, whether he hurts them on the offensive glass. At UConn, if they seal off their defensive glass, they take a big weapon away from Purdue. I talked about how Purdue can win the game. They're going to win it on offense. They're not going to win this game on defense. They're going to basically survive their defense, especially on the perimeter. Both teams will try to get the sneaky break when they can. They'll shoot the three on transition. They'll take it to the basket. We know that. They'll run when it's there. When they don't, they'll slow down and play very much half court, very methodical. And Purdue, of course, is going to try to throw the ball into the little post as much as they possibly can and run their offense through Edie, which they want to do. Edie at 40 against Tennessee. He played brilliantly. He did not play brilliantly against NC State. And Purdue turned the ball over re- ridiculously in the NC State game. If they turn it over like that tonight, they're dead. I don't think they will. Now, ironically, both teams shot 10 of 25 from three in the Saturday game. UConn is, a, as you know, if you watch them, is a very erratic three-point shooting team. And that goes for when they're open, when they're not open. I mean, they basically can be up or down from three. They have good games, they have bad games. Purdue is usually very good from three. They were not good in the Tennessee game. They made 10 against NC State, and that really killed NC State. NC State needed to have an advantage from three to have any chance to win that game, and that's why they lost by 13. Purdue wins the game by one, getting UConn, especially Klingon, into foul trouble. Number two, they win the game by keeping their turnover number reasonable, which means somewhere around 10 or under for the game. And three, and this is this will be the key, they will get good looks. Do they knock them down? Do, do they hit the shots that they have hit all year? I mean, that's really, the, that's really the key for them. Do they hit the shots that they have hit all year? Jones was big on Saturday. He was four for nine from three, and he hit some critical threes. Gillis came in and hit two big ones. Loney was three for five from three. I mean, lawyer was th- lawyer was three for five for three. Smith was basically a nightmare. He was one for nine for the game, one for five from three. These guys are good three-point shooters. Gillis, who comes in, and he's in there to go shoot that one, especially from the corner, shot 49 from three this year. Smith shot 45 from three this year. Lawyers shot, lawyers shot 43 from three, and Kaufman Wren shot 39 from three. They have five guys who can all bury a three at 40% or better. They got three guys at 44 or 45 and above. They can knock down threes. And that is going to be critical. Those are the three things they have to do. Now, where is UConn's advantage? It's not with Klingon. Klingon's not going to outscore Edie. If Klingon comes within 12 points of Edie, if he is within 12 points of Edie in terms of net scoring, that would be a, a home run. Klingon's not a scorer. He's not a good offensive player. He's still learning. He's getting better, but he's not there. He is a terrific terrific shot blocker he's very athletic he's getting better he's the better pro because he's the better athlete he's a lottery pick for sure and he's moving up Edie's methodical he's not a good defensive player he has a habit of putting the ball down low and losing it he's a good passer 
He's a very efficient offensive player. He will make his free throws. He will pass the ball well. And he's obviously got the big man shots that you expect. He is a prolific scorer. UConn wants him to get 20. They don't want him to get 40. And they don't want him to shoot 22 free throws as he did against Tennessee. If he's shooting 20 free throws, producing this game to the finish, that is critical. They are going to shoot more free throws tonight. That's going to be the case whenever Edie's in the game. Klingon's probably going to spend some time. Now, remember, he's only a 30-minute player anyway. They are not afraid to play Johnson on this in this game. Their offense changes. Their defense is going to have a problem. How their defense handles when Klingon's off the floor is going to be a very interesting thing, and I'm sure the game guys tonight will keep a stat of exactly what he does when Klingon's in the game and what he does when Klingon's out of the game. When he's out of the game, they're going to him all the time, and they're going to have to double him. They're going to have to hit him with a hard dig to try and slow him down. There's nothing else they can do. There's really, you know, his size is enormous. And he gets very easy offensive rebounds. And he's oh, and they're always looking for the lob. They're always looking to drive it into the paint. They have one eye on him, looking to flip it to him if they can for the dunk. Not force the issue, but do that. So it's going to be fascinating tonight right from the start with Klingon. They're going to challenge Edie. I don't think there's any question. And they're going to challenge Edie. On defense, because but Edie does not get in foul trouble. He does not attack a lot. He blocks shots that he can block. He doesn't go after shots he can't get to. He doesn't commit a lot of fouls. He plays amazingly for a guy that size. He plays the whole game. Now, remember, the tournament games have an incredible number of built-in stoppages. So you're playing from commercial break to commercial break. You're never going a lot of time on the clock in the NCAA tournament without a commercial break. They're built in. You don't even really need your timeouts. You can, Unless you're really getting hit with a crazy run, you don't need your timeouts in the tournament games. You can just play to the next timeout, and most guys will, especially in the first half, unless a team is just killing them because they're so frequent. Now, I've been on, I've expected this game all tournament. I've hoped for this game. And I thought Purdue would have an easy run to Tennessee. I was very worried about Tennessee, and rightly so. That game could have gone either way. They wound up winning at 66 60. And in, remember, he's, they won 66 to 60. Uh, 72 to 66, I think it was. It was six point spread. I think it was 72 to 66. He scored 40 of their points. Think about that. He scores 40, 72 to 66. He scores 40 of their 72 points. And he scores 40 on 13 to 21 from the floor. He only took 21 shots. But 14 of 22 from the foul line. In that game, Tennessee shot 11 free throws. Purdue shot 33. Now, Purdue didn't shoot well from the foul line that night in the, in the regional final. They shot 63%, which is bad. And he missed a lot of free throws. He actually missed an extra one that he didn't get uh, credit for because there was a lane violation. But he was actually 14 of 23, missed nine free throws. He usually is better than that. But like a lot of guys, big guys, late in the game, he gets a little tired. And the free throws come up short. It's happened to him a couple of times. It happened in the Tennessee game where he missed three or four critical free throws late. And they used him on the release on the press, which they should not do when it's that late in the game because he's played a lot of minutes. And a lot of times, maybe he's a little tired at that point. You don't want him on a foul line, especially when you got three guys who shoot 84%, which Purdue does. So how many free throws, foul trouble for UConn, how many free throws Purdue gets, and how 
and how much Edie dominates when Klingon's off the floor. Because at best case scenario, no foul trouble. Klingon's only playing 30 minutes. That's what he plays. He's not playing more than that. Edie's playing 40 minutes unless something happens. He does not go out of the game, which is remarkable for a guy his size. It really is. Now, where does UConn win this game? They don't win it with Klingon and Edie. Produce a better offensive team. They win it with their versatility. They win it where they always win it, with Spencer, Newton, and Caravan, and Castle. Klingon is enormously important, but he's playing against a guy who is right now a more accomplished player, a much better offensive player, and clearly the player of the year. He takes a back seat to him. We know that. But their ability and Purdue's ability to defend these guys in everything they do, which is there's nothing they don't do. They'll drive it. They'll throw lobs to each other. They'll take it to the basket. They'll shoot the three. They'll go out on the break. Castle will attack the rim. Caravan will attack the rim. He will shoot a long three. Castle's the weakest of the of the four three-point shooters. Spencer is the best. But Newton and Caravan can kill you from three. And they have a habit of taking a vulnerable point in the game and just attacking. It's almost like they smell blood in the water. And there they go. You hit a lull and they just take off. Purdue has, with the big man and his ability to get shots and his ability to get to the line, they should be able to thwart UConn runs. That's a, one of the most important things you have to do to beat them. You cannot let them get out and get a 12, 14, or the historic run that will be remembered forever, the 30-point run against Illinois, which was outrageous. But again, I mean, no team in college basketball in years had a 30-0 run on an opponent. They had that in a NCAA tournament regional final game, which is remarkable. But that's what they do to you. All of a sudden, the lead goes from 2 to 10 to 12 to 15 in an eye blink. So how Purdue handles their versatility is the difference. I think this is going to be a very good game. I think this is a game that, again, could we see Connecticut even with five or six minutes left? Absolutely. Could we see them behind a couple times in this game? Absolutely. Could they get in foul trouble? Yes. They, it's going to be a fascinating game to watch on so many levels. It's going to be a chess match. It's going to be so interesting when Klingon's in, Klingon's out, how they play him. I mean, it's going to be a fascinating game from so, if you like college basketball, it's going to be a game you're going to love from, from an X's and O's standpoint. But again, UConn is like this just predator that waits and waits and then hits. And you know what? Oh, said the right thing to them in the huddle where he said, they haven't been in any close games. We've been in a million. We handle close games. Let's see if they can. Well, you know what? They did. They got this 56 up. Places going crazy. Alabama's really playing well. They got the game tied. Did UConn blink? Nope. They didn't blink. They did not blink. Castle went to the foul line, bink, bink, hit a little floater in the lane. Now they're up 60-56, and away we go. But you realize when it came to breaking that game open, it was late when they broke that game open. It, it, they didn't break that game open, you know, 
until really late. It was Alabama was in there right to the finish. That uh, three that that Caravan hit. He hits the three. It is Sears hit, and Sears was terrific, wasn't he? Castle's a great defender, and Sears still got 24 points. That guy is a scary, he reminds me of Brunson. He's like a, he's not the playmaker Brunson is. And Brunson's still a scorer first, but he's, but this guy is a pure scorer. But at his height, he can still play in the pros with that shot. He's an amazing player. Caravan, it's 73 65 after Sears hits two free throws with 340 left. Caravan hits the straight on 26 footer. Now they're up 11. They come down. Sears makes a wild three from like 30 feet, 76, 68, two and change. Klingon gets a dunk. They come back. They get a, they get a, uh, a miss. Nelson misses a layup. They miss a three. And what happens? Newton with a minute left, breaks the game open. 83-68 with a three at 105. And then Spencer hits a three with 33 seconds left to make it 86-70. Up 16. And the final score is 86-72. So they hit a three. They hit two threes in the last minute of that game, which were critical to the score being what it was. Just shows you how well Alabama played. And that game was, you know, six, eight, four, six, eight. It was not a game where they exploded early or had big leads, and they still handled it very, very well. They're going to be in that same kind of game tonight with a team that's going to play real well offensively again and brings a lot of weapons. And the score is going to be a little lower. They're not getting 86 tonight. This game's going to be lower than that. Might be 70. Winner might get 70, 70. I don't even think they're going to get 75 in this game. I mean, I'm not interested in the over and under, but I don't think they're going to get 75. I think it's going to be lower than that. And this game will be close. The question's going to be late. Can they handle what UConn is going to dish out on offense? Because that's not their strength. And will UConn just hurt them with their athleticism on the perimeter, with their versatility, with their flexibility, with their ability to play really in and out, outside and inside? play above the rim, play below the rim, do all the things that they have to do offensively with the versatile guys they have. And I think that quartet, put the big men aside, that quartet will be too much for Purdue. Now, I'm going to say, you're asking from a point spread standpoint, if you think getting six and a half for Purdue is a good pick, I'm not, I wouldn't ever tell you that's a bad play because Purdue is a terrific team with a great scoring big man. Uh, and this is by far the best opponent they've faced. And you saw them play a close game on Saturday, so they could clearly play a close game here. And who knows? Maybe we get a game that comes down to the final shot. Who knows? But UConn has a habit of opening these games late and they've done it time after time after time. So if you've been on the Yukon bandwagon, which I clearly have, I'm not getting off now. So even though it's six and a half, and I think that is a very high line for this game, I still go with Yukon because, Hey, like I said, I've been there for all the parties. I'm not getting off now. They have been remarkable. And if you've been on their bandwagon, you're not getting off now. That's all there is to it. Both these teams 
if you're interested in such things, have covered the point spread in all five games in this tournament. Purdue, uh, uh, Connecticut's covered 11 straight NCAA tournament games. Purdue's covered all five in this tournament so far, too. And they've been great against ranked teams this year. Their numbers are staggering against the point spread. So if you liked Purdue here, I would not think you were silly. Um, but I'm sticking with UConn. I think they'll win. And I think they'll find a way to somehow get it above that very high line for this game at six and a half. Now, Calipari. Am I surprised? Yeah, I'm surprised. First of all, remember, this was a chain reaction. SMU surprisingly fired their coach after two seasons. Enfield jumps USC for SMU. USC jobs open. Musselman jumps Arkansas for USC. And then remember, two weeks ago, the AD of Kentucky held a rather ugly press conference where he had to hold a press conference to say, we are bringing John Calipari back. Now, I told you he wasn't going anywhere because the buyout was $33 million. But now, what happened at Kentucky is the fans don't want John there anymore. The love is gone. The AD and he don't like each other. They don't get along. John doesn't feel the love. He knows that the only reason he's there is because of the buyout. They would have loved to move on. So what happens is Arkansas supposedly went after some younger coaches. Hey, I don't know if they did or they didn't. Okay, let the basketball reporters go out and find that out. Did they go after Beard? Did they go after the Kansas State coach? I have no idea. Okay, if they did, they did. If they didn't, they didn't. I have no idea. But I know this. See, John, Rick, guys like that who've been around a long time, had a lot of success, made a lot of money in the sport. They hobnob with the big players. They hobnob with the big alums, the big boosters. All right? They go to the racetrack. All right? Rick was at Keelan on Saturday, which has everybody speculating. Hey, Rick is always at the racetrack, so don't, don't go by that. All right, would Rick like to go back to Kentucky? I'm sure he would. We'll get to that in a second. But he's too old. Makes no sense. Now, John feels no love. He knows that the fan base wants him out. He knows the AD wants him out. He knows they are sick of what he's done. They want him to use the NIL. He keeps bringing in freshmen. Now, he brings in great freshmen, but the, they have gone into a tremendous drought. John is a tremendous program builder. Wherever he goes, he will bring in top players and he will build the program. Has he lost with very talented teams? Yes. Has he won with talented teams? Yes. Has he, you know, been in the Final Four a bunch of times? Yes. Has he been in the championship game? Yes. Has he won a title? Yes. So has he won enough titles to suit people? Well, that's up to the, you know, the beholder. He has gone into a terrible drought at Kentucky. They don't want him there anymore. He knows that. John doesn't need money. He has more money than he could ever spend. He's made a fortune. He made a fortune with the Nets. He made a fortune. Forget it. He's got a ton of money. And he gets a call from a big Arkansas booster. Now, remember, Arkansas is falling on some hard times, but Arkansas is a place where you can win big. Just ask Nolan Richardson. They have great facilities. They have more money than they can count. They have great alum. They are first class in every way. It's a, it's a nice place to live. He'll be loved when he shows up there now because they love their programs. They have as powerful an alum base as you have. You have Jerry Jones. You have the Wal the Walmart people. And remember, the Walmart people are all Arkansas people. It's their building. They, they, the name, they, it's been named after them. The Walton family is huge at Arkansas. And Tyson is another big billionaire booster. And he's John's buddy. So Tyson calls him up and says, hey, John, listen, how about this, this, this? And John says, hey, if I'm going to do this, I got to have this, 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 and this. They said, hey, no problem. So they gave him whatever he wanted. They promised him a ton of NIL money. 
He hasn't really wanted to play the NIL game. He's going to have to there. He'll also recruit players there. And he gets away from what is an ugly, terrible, and for him, intolerable situation in Kentucky. Kentucky's happy because they don't have to pay him $33 million to go goodbye. They want to get rid of him. So they're happy. The question is, where do they go for a coach? Now, Kentucky's like the Yankees. They start at the top. They're Kentucky. There's only one Kentucky. So they're going to go after the usual suspects. Will they go after Danny Hurley? Maybe. He's not going to leave. Will they go after Jay Wright? Absolutely. Will Jay Wright take it? Not a chance. They'll go after Billy Donovan. Will Billy Donovan leave to take it? I don't know. I don't know what Billy's thinking. Those are the automatic calls. They'll call the Celtics. You know why. Okay, if you don't know why, you're not a big college basketball guy. Right? They'll get a no there, too. Now, who do they go after? Do they go after Oates? He's at Alabama. He's got a big buyout. Now, everyone's going to get into this Patino thing. Patino was at Lexington, was in Lexington on Saturday because he was at Keeneland. Keeneland is a stone's throw from the University of Kentucky, which is in Lexington. You land in Lexington, Keeneland's across the street, Kentucky's down the block. It's not a big town. It's a great town. It's a beautiful town. One of the really underrated towns in America. A gorgeous place. And has a lot of wealth. Lexington. Um, and they love two things. Horses. Well, there are three things. Count bourbon. But horses, bourbon, and basketball. Now, Rick tells people now, hey, if I had to do it over again, I would never leave Kentucky. He did great at Kentucky. He built a monster team at Kentucky, won the championship, and then obviously left. Rick is always leaving. He's got that, he's that, he's, he likes to jump around. He's always been one of those guys. Would he leave St. John's for Kentucky? In a heartbeat. Will they take him? Not at this age. It doesn't make any sense. Hey, do their fans like him? They love him. He won for them. They have fond memories. Okay. They love to screw Louisville. All right. It all, but he's going on 72 years of age. You're going to hire a 72 year old coach? No. It doesn't make any sense. Now, it, don't, Patino wouldn't worry about how it looked that he left St. John's or anything else. He would jump, he would run there, but he's not going to get off the job. That's all there is to it. He's too old. So where do they go? We'll see. I gave you the names at the top that they'll clearly call. They're going to call Billy Donovan. They're going to call... I don't know if they call Danny or not. They're going to call Jay Wright. He's going to say no. Jay Wright found this NIL thing all very distasteful, and he's 100% accurate about it. And he got out in front of it. He was very smart. Same reason Saban got out. Why Saban got out? Because you heard what he said. He said, all my players want to know is how much money they're making now. Who wants to coach in that situation? And it's getting worse by the day. I mean, college sports, we know it, is dead. So who winds up there? I'm not sure. You know, and I don't really care. So when it happens, fine. I'm not going to go make phone calls to find out. I'm past those days. So there's guys out there who can do that. They can go out and run around and speculate. But, hey, it's a dream job for anybody. Very few guys coaching in college would say no to Kentucky. If they're in their prime in their career, it's a hard no. Now, remember, a lot of these schools have gotten to the point where they have put these very significant buyouts in these contracts. It's a very normal thing now to have a very big buyout as protection. See, Kentucky doesn't care that Arkansas, they don't have to worry about the buyout Arkansas because Kentucky wants them gone. So they're like, see ya. 
don't the door hit you. Now they're now they just saved thirty three million dollars. They got rid of Calipari, which is what they wanted, and they saved thirty three million dollars to boot. So now they can invest that in their new coach, and whatever they save, they can put in their NILs. So Calipari goes to Arkansas. Will he win there? Yes, he wins everywhere he goes. The question is, will he win the big one? He has had more talented teams than anybody else. So from that standpoint, people can be very critical of his performance, especially recently. Now, a couple other things. Mets win a couple in Cincinnati. They go to Atlanta for four. They're three and six. Okay. Lindor finally hit. I knew Lindor was going to hit yesterday. Why? Because the lefty was pitching. If you've noticed how predominant it has gotten, Lindor kills left-handed pitching. What did he do yesterday? Double homer. I have to confess, I bet Lindor, they hit a homer yesterday. I don't usually bet home run guys. You know, he was, I thought I was going to get like six to one. I got 325. I was, I was like, wow, 325. But they're smart. They know he hits home runs against lefties. Lefty was pitching. He hit a double his first time up in the middle of the game. He hit a home run. So he had a couple of hits. Here's how amazing it is. And people have made a big deal about this. Last year, he had 31 home runs. He hit 15 right hand, left-handed in 417 at-bats. Not bad. He hit 16 in 185 at-bats right-handed. That's Ruthian. 16 homers in 185 at-bats is a homer every 11 at-bats. That's Mark McGuire numbers. He kills left-handed pitching. Last year, he hit 281 and 240 against righties. But his slugging was up around 600 against lefties and about 400 against righties. He kills left-handed pitching, and he did again yesterday. As for the Yankees, they're 8-2. and two. They're flying high. And Stanton yesterday, you know, everyone hates Stanton until he hits those bombs, and they love him. He got he got the swing in the day before and got a home run and got a couple of hits and then yesterday he got he got into one and when he gets into one I mean nobody moves in the stadium you always know when a ball's crushed the left fielder or the outfielder it's hit over it doesn't move well last yesterday was one of those the ball off the bat you just knew it was way way gone grand slammer Yankees win Yanks are doing fine they're eight and two Mets are three and six. That's where we are. And the Mets, four in Atlanta, which is obviously very, very dangerous territory for them right now. At three and six, they don't want to come out of there three and 10. So try to get a win where you can. If they get two, they throw a party. Now remember, Masters this week. So we will have wall to wall action. Tomorrow, I'll go over all the stuff with the Masters. Wednesday, we'll preview it. We'll we'll do everything with the Masters. Long shots, you know, favorites, the whole thing. Scheffler is a heavy favorite. He's 4-1. to The next guy's 11-1. to Rahm and McIlroy. Everybody's going to like Rory because he played well yesterday. Don't get into that. Rory's, you know, until he puts better, I don't see him winning any majors. Now, could he be in the leader? Could he be on the board? Absolutely. Is he going to win it? I doubt it. Scheffler, four to one, not good odds. And I love Scheffler, but I'm not betting him to win the Masters at four to one. Rahm at 12 to one or 11 to one is a, is a pretty decent price. And there's better prices. So we'll get to that. We'll do plenty wall to wall daily on the Masters, which I love, which begins on Thursday. So we have a couple of days with that. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm eclipsed out. I am eclipsed out. I mean, I can't watch any more things on TV. You watch a news performance now, a, a news program now, the network news. You know, at 6 30, I like to turn the network news on. Everything is about this eclipse. Hey, I'm driving on the highway the other day, and the board says, you know, the board's up there. A 
clips Monday. Use mass transit. Why do you have to use mass transit? This thing takes somewhere between three and four minutes maximum. So you're telling me if you're driving along and it gets dark and you turn your car lights on, which is supposed to be on anyway, you can't drive for three minutes? Or if it's somehow dangerous to your vision, pull over and close your eyes for three minutes. It's three minutes. Maybe four minutes maximum. I don't get it. Now, I'm not a science guy. I don't like science. I don't like science fiction. I don't watch science fiction movies. I've told you that many times. I've never seen the greatest science fiction movies ever made. I've never seen any of them. I've never seen a Star Wars movie. I've never seen 2001. Whatever you would consider the great, I don't watch horror movies. I don't watch Chop Chop movies like Halloween. And I don't watch science fiction. I like, you know, movies. Boy meets girl, boy loses girl. Good triumphs over evil. You know, that kind of stuff. I don't like science. So I don't want to rain on everybody's parade and go into a rant about this eclipse stuff. If you're big on it, if your kids are big on it, God bless. But, I mean, enough already. Please, can it just happen already? I mean, the Yankees moved their game because of it. They moved the time of their game. You have network specials today in the middle of the day to cover this thing. It's four minutes. Give me a break, please. You know, one historical note, Purdue's in the final for the first time since 1969. That was a very important college basketball game. And I remember it was a sunny day on a Saturday afternoon. And I was playing in a game, a baseball game. And I wanted to get home to see the game. And in those days, the Final Four used to be on Thursday night, and the championship game was Saturday. This was Lou Alcindor's last game. Now, Purdue had a really good team, and they had a great sharpshooter named Rick Mount. If you remember in those days, there were three ultra scorers. I mean, ultra scorers. The great Calvin Murphy, who I loved at Niagara, who scored 69 points in a game, who was a great scorer. I mean, would score 40, score 50. Pete Maravich at LSU, who was the leading scorer ever, and Rick Mount, all sharpshooters, all first-team All-Americans, all great shooters, and all wonderful players. Murphy became a good NBA player. Mount really you know, had, didn't. Maravich, obviously, we know the saga of Pete. Mount had 28 in the game. Jabbar was his last game. He became Jabbar. He was Lou Alcindor. Remember, they took the dunk out when he went to college. He played three years in college. He went 88 and 2 at UCLA, won three national championships, was the most outstanding player in the tournament three years in a row. This was his swan song. It was Jabbar a sophomore named Curtis Rowe, Lynn Shackelford, who had that left-handed shot from the corner, the other forward, John Vallely and Hines in the backcourt. Jabbar had 37 points on 15 to 20 shooting and 20 rebounds. 37 and 20, a nice tidy game in a 20-point win and his last game. And I remember SI always had a lot of coverage of Alcindor. And it was Lou's last game. Dad was in attendance. It was a big game. He was coming to the pros, the whole thing. The end of the Alcindor era. Would it be the end of the UCLA dynasty? And it wasn't. Because they had a forward on the bench on that team named Sidney Wicks. And Wicks and Rowan Patterson kept winning until the redhead ball of fire got to UCLA by the name of Bill Walton. And all he did 
was lead UCLA to 88 straight wins. And two national championships before those guys decided to get a little reckless and a little wild in their senior year, and they lost four games. A game at Notre Dame, which broke the 88-game streak. The lost weekend, Oregon and Oregon State, and they got beat by both teams. They used to play both on the same way. They go to Washington State and Washington one weekend, and they went to Oregon and Oregon State. Lonnie Shelton beat them. They lost back-to-back games. N- unheard of. This was a team that had won 88 games in a row. Walton won his first 60 or 70-something games at UCLA. Lost to Notre Dame, lost to Oregon and Oregon State, and then played the semifinal classic against NC State, which they lost in overtime in the semifinal game. And NC State went on to win the championship against Marquette and Al McGuire in the championship game with the great David Thompson. You know, Thompson, they had a big center named Burleson. They had a little guard named Monty Tao, Howard. I mean, it was a, it was a, a good, but Thompson was like Michael Jordan before Michael Jordan. He wound up with a terrible drug problem. But I remember those days and the UCLA dynasty. And, you know, we haven't had a team as dominant as UCLA until this team. Georgetown with Ewing was never as dominant as this team is. The great UNLV teams was never as dominant as this UConn team is. The great Duke teams, never as dominant. Florida back-to-back, never as dominant. What UConn is doing, if they can finish tonight, is that amazing. They will be one of the dominant champions of all time. They will be an historical team if they finish this the same way this evening. That's how special what they've done is. And check it out. Tonight's a very special Monday night game. We'll see you later.